In this chapter, we're going to be talking about exchange rates. And exchange rates for a lot of people are kind of mysterious, but really once you stop to think about what they are, they should be pretty straightforward. An exchange rate is simply the price of one currency in terms of another currency. So if we were thinking about uh, the euro, we could think about how many dollars it would cost to buy one euro. So there, the dollar you're, is the price that you're paying, the number of dollars, and what you're buying would be the other currency, the euro. So one challenge with international trade is that if you think about how things work, say, within a country, within the United States, it's easy to compare prices um, for goods that you may buy in a different state. If you go to another state and you're going to buy something, that's easy because they're in dollars and, and it's easy for you to, to think about your purchasing power because you don't have to make any type of conversion. But if you go to another country that uses a different currency, then thinking about relative prices becomes more challenging because you have to make this conversion from um, that currency into dollars and then think about how that dollar price is related to your income to understand how um, whether or not you want to buy it or not. So we can think about an exchange rate in terms of either currency. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, our, our reference currency will be the dollar. Um, so if we were thinking about, say, the dollar versus the yen, we could think about that exchange rate in terms of the number of dollars that it costs to buy one yen, or we could think about the exchange rate in terms of the number of yen that it costs to buy one dollar. Let's start the first way. If we were thinking about the dollar to yen exchange rate, so it would look something like this. The number of dollars to buy per one yen would be 0.009421 and that would be to purchase one yen. This would be what we would call direct terms. So if you're thinking about the exchange rate in terms of how many dollars, in terms of how much of your currency you have to give up to buy the other currency, you're thinking about the exchange rate in direct terms. We can also think about it in indirect terms. How many yen does it take to purchase one dollar? So if we were thinking about the number of yen that it takes to purchase one dollar, it would be 106.15. The inverse of that per dollar, so it would take 106.15 yen to buy one dollar. If we were thinking about it that way, we would be thinking about it in indirect terms. it would be the opposite in the other country, of course. Their thinking about it in direct terms would be this one, and for them to think about it in indirect terms, it would be that one, okay? So, an exchange rate is simply an asset price. And if we think about what an asset is, an asset is simply a way of storing wealth to save for the future. It's a store of value, okay? And the, the price of any asset is going to be directly related to what people expect it to be worth in the future. So today's exchange rate is going to be closely tied to people's future expectations about that exchange rate. We'll talk about that a lot here in just a little bit. First, let's talk about converting prices. So let's do a simple example. The, the conversions are, are very straightforward. It's not hard to convert prices using exchange rates. Um, let's talk about how to convert prices. So converting prices. Let's suppose that we have a, uh, you're considering purchasing a book that cost 50 British pounds. So book costs 50 British pounds. The symbol for pounds is that. Um, if we're thinking about Converting that, then we need to know the exchange rate. Let's suppose the exchange rate is $1.50 per pound. We'll write it out. So that's the direct exchange rate if we wanted to buy pounds. So in this case, the dollar price would be the number of pounds, the pound price, 50. 
you have to multiply it by the direct exchange rate and that would be multiplied by 1.50. The way that I always have thought about this is if you think about this exchange rate, this is the number of dollars per pound. And that's going to be telling us the dollar price. The dollar price, if you make that conversion, is going to be $75. The way that I always, when I first was learning how to do this, it can be a little bit tricky to know whether or not you need to use the direct exchange rate or the indirect exchange rate. If you keep track of this, dollars per pound, then you notice that what's going to happen is the pounds here are going to cancel out with the pounds in our denominator. It's going to leave us with dollars. Okay? If you use the indirect exchange rate, then you would have pounds per dollar, and the pounds up here would not cancel with the dollars down there, and so then you'd be stuck. You'd be making the wrong calculation. Okay? Let's do another one. Let's suppose that the exchange rate is different than 150. Let's just see how a change in the exchange rate is going to affect the dollar price of the book. So let's suppose that the pound price is still $50. Let's suppose that the exchange rate is now $1.25. That's dollars per pound. If you multiply that out, you're going to get $62.50. So the if the exchange rate, direct exchange rate falls, then that reduces the dollar price of the book clearly because what happens here is that up here we had to spend a dollar and a half to buy a pound and here we only have to spend a dollar and 25 cents to buy each of those pounds. And what's happening there is what we call an appreciation or a depreciation of the currency. And we can think about currencies appreciating or depreciating from either point of view. So let's think about what that means. When the dollar price of a pound falls, we say that the pound has depreciated. We can also describe that if the dollar price of a pound falls like it does here, we can say that the dollar has appreciated. So a depreciation of the pound is the same as an appreciation of the dollar. Okay. What we are seeing here is that a depreciation of a country's currency, here the pound is depreciating, a depreciation of a country's currency makes its goods cheaper for foreigners. Okay. So the dollar price for us of that book fell from $75 to $62.50. It would be more... Um, uh, inexpensive for us to purchase goods that are denominated in um, British pounds after the depreciation of the pound. So when a country's currency depreciates, its exports are cheaper for foreigners. What that means for residents of that country is that other countries' goods are more expensive. If, if the dollar were to depreciate, then that means we need more dollars to buy pounds and to buy other currencies if it depreciates against other currencies also. And that means foreign goods are more expensive for us. Okay? So you can start to see that it gets a little bit confusing when you're thinking about direct versus indirect terms and you can describe a change in the exchange rate as an appreciation or a depreciation an appreciation or depreciation depending upon which point of view you're taking. So as long as you're just careful and deliberate about how you think about it, it, it hopefully won't be too uh, confusing. So let's talk about relative prices for a second. If you think about import and export demands, those are going to be a function of relative prices, just like all demand curves are when you are deciding whether or not to purchase something or how much of something you're purchasing, it's relative price that matters. The price of the good relative to your purchasing power, relative to, to the price of your labor, or the price of the good relative to the prices of other goods that you could be buying. And exchange rates allow us to compare prices denominated in different currencies. And there are a couple of steps that we're going to go through. What you need to do to figure out the... Uh, 
relative prices is simply to put the prices into the same currency and then figure out relative prices. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. Let's talk about the foreign exchange market. So our goal here, foreign exchange market, our goal is going to be to understand what causes exchange rates to go up or down. What causes an appreciation or depreciation of a country's currency? What causes that price to change? And you've probably at this point been in economics long enough to know that if a price is changing, that is almost always due to demand and supply. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. It's going to, it's going to come down to demand for a currency versus supply of that currency. Um, so let's talk about the market where that happens, the foreign exchange market. If we think about the participants in the market, there are several participants that are, are buying and selling currencies. Um, the biggest one is going to be commercial banks. So banks that are dealing with um, corporations, they're going to be transacting a majority of foreign exchange transactions. Um, we call any exchange between two banks, we call that interbank trading. Um, but commercial banks are going to account for a vast majority of the transactions. Um, there are also corporations that are going to need to exchange currencies. And the reason that corporations are going to do that is because a corporation may have to buy inputs from another country and so they're going to have to pay for those inputs with that country's currency. So they're going to have to make an exchange of their currency for the other currency. There are going to be a number of transactions from uh, non-bank financial institutions. So we can say non-bank financial institutions. So for example, pension funds um, are going to be transacting some amount of, of uh, foreign currency. And then there are going to be the central banks of, of different countries. Central banks. Central banks may have as their part of their goal an attempt to influence the exchange rate. And so they may be buying or selling different amounts of a currency based upon what their policy is. Um, so sometimes central banks will, will intervene into the foreign exchange market. So those are the main players. If you were to go to another country, you could exchange some of your currency for the other country's currency. So you could be a, a teeny tiny player in this market. But if we're looking at, at the big players, this is a, a pretty representative list of them. Let's talk about kind of the characteristics of the market. So the way this market works is that a vast majority of the trading, all the trading, takes place in major cities around the world. We think about the volume of it, just to get an idea of how the volume of, of foreign currency exchange has changed over time. If you were to look back at 1998 and the amount of foreign currency transactions that took place, it was around $600 billion per day. Quite a bit. $600 billion per day. If you were to look forward to 2004, it was about $1.9 trillion per day. So a pretty large increase from 98 to 2004. If you were to look now at 2019, um, it's about 6.6 .6 trillion per day. So you can see that the amount of foreign currency transactions has increased dramatically. It's very large. Trading, because it's taking place all over the world in major cities, trading in foreign currencies takes place 24 hours a day, it never ceases. That market never closes. If you were to look at, say, the New York Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange opens and closes. It opens in the morning, during weekdays, closes in the evening. 
and trading does not take place during those times when it's closed. In the foreign exchange market, it's open. Um, there's no, no closing time. There's no part of the day when foreign currencies are not being traded. Um, and the major markets are the U.S., London, you can look at Frankfurt, Singapore, Tokyo. What that means is there, there's no opportunity for there to be any difference between the foreign exchange in one country and the foreign exchange rate between two currencies in one country and the same two currencies in another country. If there was a difference between those, then people would pick up on that difference, difference and arbitrage that market. They would buy where the price is lower and sell where the price is higher. And so anytime those differences pop up, the, the arbitrage potential of that causes them to vanish relatively quickly. If you look at the a majority of the transactions that take place in the foreign exchange market, Though a majority of those transactions are done through the dollar. We say that, that we use the phrase through the dollar. What that means is that let's say you wanted to exchange uh, British pounds for Israeli shekels. Then what you would do is you would exchange your pounds for dollars first and then your dollars for shekels second. And, and that would be, we would describe that as trading through the dollar. The dollar there is what we describe as a vehicle currency. And the reason that you would do that is that it's going to be easier to find somebody who wants to exchange dollars for shekels than it is somebody who wants to exchange pounds for shekels. And so a vast majority of trading in international currencies between any two currencies that aren't dollars are done through the dollar. We can think about um, different types of prices. There's what we call a spot rate. So a spot rate is the price that you would pay or the exchange rate that you would, would be quoted to you um, in on-the-spot trading. So if you were going to be purchasing British pounds right now or euros, if you were going to buy euros right now, you would be quoted the spot rate and we would call that a spot transaction. It, it takes place right now. There's also what we call a forward rate. And a forward rate is a rate that would be quoted to you for an exchange that's going to take place at some point in the future, at some point more than two days away. So it could be a, a 30 day forward rate or a 90 day forward rate or it could be um, several years into the future. And you might wonder, well, why would I agree on a price right now for a transaction that's going to take place in a year? And the reason that you might do that, let's suppose that you're a, a corporation and you know that in one year you're going to be buying some inputs from another country. So in one year you know you're going to need to be exchanging your currency for this other currency. Then what you might desire to do is reduce some of the risk by agreeing right now to purchase that currency at a particular rate at that point in the future, one year in the future, and then you'll know exactly what the price that you're going to have to pay is going to be. And it would be, you could negotiate that forward rate. It's going to, the forward rates, like all rates, are going to be determined in a market, but depending upon the amount of currency that you're transacting, there may be some negotiation that goes on there. Um, there's also what's described uh, uh, in your textbook as a foreign exchange swap. Foreign exchange swap. What that is is just the name that we give to the combination of a spot sale along with a forward sale. And we don't need to go into why you might want to do that. Let's just suffice it to say that there are going to be some hedging reasons why you might want to do that. But that's a, a spot sale combined with a forward sale. In this market, we can also think about futures and options, which you may have heard of in a, a different class. If we think about a futures contract, a futures contract 
is simply a promise to deliver a specified amount of foreign currency at some specific date in the future. And so similar to what's going on with this forward rate, it's, it's a way of, of ensuring that you have a specific amount of foreign currency at a point in the future when you need it. We don't really need to go into uh, the way futures contracts work. We could spend a whole semester's class talking about how that, that works. Let's talk about briefly options contracts. So we could talk about an option. What an option is, is you're buying the right to exchange a certain amount of foreign currency at some point in the future. You don't have to exercise that option and you can buy two different types of options. You can buy a put option or you can buy a call option. A put option means that at some point in the future you're going to sell a specific amount of um, foreign currency and a call option means that you can exercise the right to buy a specific amount of foreign currency at some point in the future. And again, we don't need to go into anything more than just to understand what those terms mean because if you're talking about the foreign exchange market, you're going to run into those occasionally. So what we need to do now is I'm going to clear the board and then we'll start talking about the demand for um, foreign currency assets and we'll see how that works. All right, so if our goal is to understand how exchange rates are determined, then we need to think about the things that affect the demand for foreign currencies, foreign currency assets. And this is going to be very similar if you've talked about, say, how stock prices are determined. So the way a stock price is determined is, is actually very, very straightforward. Being able to predict it is, is nearly impossible, but understanding what's going on is, is very straightforward. If you look at the way a stock price, a corporation's stock, what, how the price at which that is bought and sold, um, the supply is, is, there's some supply of stock out there and that supply does not change very frequently at all. What price changes are driven by are changes in demand. So understanding what causes the price to change comes down to understanding what causes demand to change. And if you think about what causes, what the important determinants of the demand curve for a stock are, the, the most important one is going to be expectations about the future price of that stock. The other determinants are, are, have maybe a little bit of influence, but it is by far determined mostly by um, expectations about future price and that's going to be what we see here. <clears throat> expectations about future exchange rates are going to be the key thing that drives what the exchange rate is right now. So let's talk about um, understanding what a currency is going to be worth in the future. So we judge the desirability of any asset based upon its rate of return in the future. But keep in mind, you've talked about in a principles of macro class, that what matters is not the nominal rate of return, but the real rate of return. So if you take a nominal rate of return and you want to turn it into a real rate of return, you need to subtract off the uh, inflation rate. So if, it, if the dollar value of some asset rises by, say, 10% and there's 2% inflation over that time, then the actual um, value, the real value of that asset has only gone up by 8%. Okay, so we're going to need to keep that in mind. If we want to compare rates of return across different assets, they need to be in the same um, unit of value. We need them in the same currency. So we can't compare a real rate with a dollar rate or a real rate with a euro rate and we can't compare a dollar rate with a euro rate. So we can't look at, at the rate of return on dollars and the rate of return on euros and directly compare that, as tempting as that might be. So we need to think about that um, very carefully. What we need to do is we need to put everything into one currency. 
And once you have everything in one currency, then you can see what, how the rates of return are going to uh, compare for different types of assets. So what we know is that all other things equal, people are going to want to hold assets with the highest expected real rate of return. There are a couple of other things that go into um, a couple other characteristics of an asset that go into that decision. One of them is going to be risk. You've probably talked about that in a principles of macro class. Um, returns are unpredictable. So savers typically do not like high variability in their wealth. And, and how much risk you're willing to accept is also typically a function of, of where you are at in the lifetime of savings that you're going to do. And what I mean by that is young people typically are willing to accept more risk because if a bad incident happens, there's more time to recover from that. The older you tend to get, older savers tend to be willing to ex accept much less risk because as you get closer and closer to needing to use that, that, that wealth that you're saving, you don't want it to be jumping up and down in value. You want to reduce risk so that there's more certainty in terms of what you're going to have when you need it. <clears throat> there's also another characteristic of assets that we call liquidity. All other things equal, we like more liquid assets rather than less liquid assets. And the liquidity of, asset, of an asset has to do with how quickly it can be converted into the the economy's medium of exchange. So if you have an asset um, like say uh, money in a savings account, that can be converted into dollars in your hand much faster than wealth that's held in the form of a house. If you've got wealth held in the form of a house, that's an asset, but you would first have to go through the process of selling that house, which can take time, before you would have dollars in your hand that you can use to buy goods and services. So all other things equal, the more liquid an asset is, the more preferable it is. There's also a trade-off between um, liquidity and real rate of return and a trade-off between risk and real rate of return. So if we want to compare real rates of return, we need a couple of different pieces of information. So if we want to think about demand for currencies and think about the real rate of return for different currencies so that we can see which currency we want to hold wealth in, which currency we want to use as our vehicle for saving, we need a couple of pieces of information. The first thing that we're going to need is going to be the interest rate. So we're going to need to know how much currency you can earn by lending a unit of that currency. Okay. So what's the dollar interest rate or the interest rate on dollars that you could earn and what's the interest rate on the other currency that you could earn? Probably we'll use euros as we go through this. Um, and then we need to know the exchange rate. So in order to compare the return on different assets, clearly we're going to need to know the exchange rate and we're going to need to know the expected change in the exchange rate. Expected change in the exchange rate. So we're going to need to know whether what our expectation is about whether the exchange rate is going to go up or down over time. So let's take a look at, at how this works. Let's suppose that today's exchange rate Let's start there. Today's exchange rate, let's suppose, is $1.10 per euro. Okay, so it, it costs $1.10 to buy a euro. But let's suppose that you expect that to change. Suppose you expect it to be, let's say, $1.165 per euro in the future. Let's suppose that the dollar interest rate 
um, is going to be, let's have, let's suppose it's 10%, dollar interest rate, 10%, and let's suppose the euro interest rate is 5%. So what we're interested in here is, is how should we hold our wealth? Should we hold our wealth in dollars or should we hold our wealth in euros? It would be nice if it was as simple as just comparing these, right? Because if, if you could just say, well, the dollar gives us a 10% rate of return and the euro gives us a 5% rate of return, so we should clearly hold the dollar. It would be great if it was that simple, but it's not. What we have to do is we have to think about What's going to be happening to the exchange rate over time while we're holding our, our wealth in whichever currency we've put it in? So let's be, let's be deliberate in terms of how we go through this. There's an easy way to do this, but in order to understand the easy way, we need to go step by step through, it's not really the hard way, let's just say, let's call it the long way. So let's figure out, let's use these numbers to figure out what a dollar deposit is going to earn us in a year and what a euro deposit is going to earn us a year, in a year. So what we know from this is that a deposit of one dollar, deposit of one dollar pays a dollar ten in one year. 1.1 in one year. Let's think about what a, a one euro deposit is going to pay us. So a deposit of one euro pays one point oh five euros in one year. So our question is, which offers the highest real rate of return? So there's some steps that you need to go through. The first step is you need to find the dollar price of a euro deposit. So step one, find the, find, let's call it the current, find the current dollar price of a euro deposit of, let's do that one euro. We need to know the exchange rate to do that. Our exchange rate is $1, 1.1 1 .1 right now. So dollar price currently of that deposit is going to be $1.1 dollars. Let's say per euro that we want to deposit. So that's the first step, find the dollar price of that. The second step, we're going to use the euro interest rate to find the amount of euros you would have a year from now if you deposited one euro. We already know that, so let's say um, use euro interest rate. to find the value of a one euro deposit. And we know that that's going to be 1.05 euros. Third step, we're going to use the exchange rate that you expect to prevail one year in the future to calculate the expected dollar value of this amount. So we want to know how much is that going to be worth in one year, given what we expect about the exchange rate in one year. So that's going to be this dollar amount, 1.05 euros that we're going to have in one year, times that dollar to euro exchange rate that we expect, which is 1.165 and that is dollars per euro 
And we want that because the euros here are going to cancel out. It's going to leave us with dollars. What that gives us, if we were to look at, do that multiplication, that is $1.223. Now the fourth step is to figure out what the dollar rate of return is. What's the expected dollar rate of return if we made that transaction? So we're going to look at the rate of change in the amount of dollars that we've got. So we ended up with $1.223. Dollar, $1 we're going to subtract where we started. So we want to find out how much our dollars changed by. It started at 1.1. We're going to divide by where it started. All we're doing should be 1.10. All we're doing is finding the rate of return, percentage change. That gives us, we could multiply by 100. Um, let's skip that. Let's just call it 0 0.11. It's 11%. And then, of course, the last step, fifth step, is going to be to compare that rate of return with the rate of return on dollars. So if we just held our dollars in a, a dollar deposit, we would earn 10%. If instead we convert them to euros, hold them as euros for a year at 5%, we can earn an 11% real rate of return. So you do better, let's compare the result from, let's say step four, to the dollar interest rate. And what we just said is that clearly you're going to do better by holding your wealth in euro deposits than you would do by holding them in dollar deposits. Even though that euro, euro interest rate is smaller, you have to take this change into consideration. Okay. So now what we need to do is clear this off and then we'll talk about the easy way. This takes a long time, but there's actually a pretty easy way to do it. And so let's clear this and then we'll take a look at that. All right, let's take a look at the easier way to do this. So the first step to doing it the easy way is to, to think about the rate of depreciation of the dollar against the euro. And we'll think of that as the percentage increase in the dollar euro exchange rate over the year. So if we look at our exchange rate, what we saw is it, it changed by a certain amount. Let's calculate the percent change. So it ended up at 1.165. It started at 1.1. So that's how much it changed by. We're going to divide by where it started, 1.1. That gives us 0 0.059. So if we multiplied by 100 over here, that would be 5.9%. Uh, Let's just call it about 6%. So the dollar price of a euro went up from 1.1 to 1.165. The dollar depreciated. The other way to think about that is that the pound appreciated. So this we can think about as the percentage depreciation of the dollar. Percent depreciation of the dollar compared to the pound. And then the dollar rate of return on euro deposits is going to end up being approximately equal to the euro interest rate plus the rate of depreciation of the dollar against the euro. So let's write that out because that's the key to it. The dollar rate of return, dollar rate of return is approximately equal to the 
the euro rate of return euro rate of return plus that percent depreciation of the dollar plus the percent depreciation of the dollar against the euro of course so our euro interest rate was 5% the dollar depreciated against the euro by about 6% that gives us approximately the 11% rate of return in euro deposits okay so that's the easy way just think about if you're comparing if I were to give you say on a homework or if I were to give you on a test which I will a problem where you've got a, a a rate of return in one currency and a rate of return in dollars and then I give you the current exchange rate and the expected exchange rate then all you have to do is look at the expected rate of depreciation between the two currencies how much is the dollar going to either appreciate or depreciate relative to the currency and then the currency the dollar rate of return of the of deposits held in the other currency in this case the dollar rate of return in euro deposits is going to be the euro rate of return plus the rate of depreciation expected rate of depreciation okay so it's it's a, a pretty straightforward process if you do it like this again you just have to be very deliberate about writing out what you've got and making sure that you're multiplying or adding and subtracting the right things it, it as long as you're deliberate about how you do it, it's relatively easy. So let's write some of this out in, in general. So we've been working with numbers here, and I know numbers make people feel more comfortable because you end up with this nice, simple answer that looks like that. What we need to do to, to figure out how this market is going to work is to think about what this looks like in general. So let me give you some, some symbols that we'll use for this. If we let's let this symbol r euro be the interest rate on euro deposits so this will be today's interest rate on euro euro deposits today's interest rate on euro deposits let's identify the exchange rate we typically use e as the exchange rate but we can think about the exchange rate either way so let's talk about the dollar to euro exchange rate so this is today's dollar to euro exchange rate and then let's talk about the expected exchange rate so for this one we're going to use the same symbol dollar to euro exchange rate except we're going to put a little e up there that's what we expect the exchange rate to be in a certain period of time we'll just say a year so this is the expected exchange rate in a year So now let's write out symbolically what we've done right here. Okay, so what we did is we took the euro exchange rate and we added the expected rate of depreciation. So let's just write out what this looks like. What we've got, the calculation we made was that we took the euro exchange rate, or excuse me, the euro interest rate, and then we added to that the expected rate of depreciation. So we took the expected exchange rate of dollars per euro we subtracted off the current exchange rate dollars per euro we divided by the current exchange rate dollars per euro this should be this is the ratio this is the interest rate plus this ratio don't think about this r plus that as being all divided by this i hope that 
makes sense. So this is written out symbolically what we've done right there. This is the expected depreciation of the dollar. Expected depreciation of the dollar relative to the euro, of course. And what we want to do is compare this. This is compared to the rate of return on dollar deposits. So this is the dollar value of what we could earn on a euro deposit. This is what the dollar value or the rate of return that we can get on a dollar deposit. So let's write out here the expected difference. So the expected rate of return difference. Let's be real clear about what we're writing here. The expected rate of return difference looks like this. It's the dollar rate of return minus the expected dollar value of a euro deposit. So that's going to be minus the euro rate of return minus, when we subtract this off, this that plus is going to become a minus, minus this expected depreciation of the dollar. And so that looks like this. So that's the comparison we're making. If this whole thing is positive, then that tells us that the rate of return on dollar deposits is higher than it would be if we converted them to euro and euros and held them as euro deposits for a year. If this is negative, then this is telling us that holding them as euros for a year gives us a higher rate of return than holding them as dollars for a year. What we need to do now is talk about putting this together and, and thinking about equilibrium in the foreign exchange market. So just like, as I said earlier, just like almost everything else in, in economics, it boils down to demand and supply. And so let's think about how this, we can work this into a model that helps us understand what's going to cause the exchange rate to go up, what's going to cause the exchange rate to go down. So I need to clear this off and then we'll take a closer look at this. If we want to talk about equilibrium in the foreign exchange market, then the most basic way to understand it is that the exchange rate is going to adjust to bring quantity demanded and quantity supplied of a particular currency into equilibrium or into balance with each other. So let's start by thinking about a concept that we're going to call interest parity. Interest parity. The foreign exchange market is in equilibrium when deposits of all currencies yield the same real rate of return. So when all assets are equally desirable. And that happens when that condition that we just had down here, when the dollar rate of return is equal to the euro rate of return, and we saw that that was equal to the euro interest rate plus the expected rate of depreciation. So that looked like this. If the dollar rate of return is equal to what we can earn by converting our dollars into euros, and then holding them as euros for a year, if that's equal, then this market's going to be in equilibrium. If they aren't equal, if the dollar rate of return is higher than what we could earn holding them as euros, or vice versa, if the euro return is higher, then people would be either buying euros and getting rid of dollars, or vice versa. Let's suppose that the dollar rate of return is higher then people would be attempting to sell euros and buy dollars. 
there would be excess supply of euros, excess demand for dollars, and the thing that's going to bring the exchange or bring the two together is going to be changes in the exchange rate. Okay, so the idea behind what's going on here is very simple, although it things like this make it look complicated. It's really not. Before we put a picture of this together, and rest assured that the picture is going to look like a basic demand supply type model, so it's not going to be anything outrageous. Before we do that, we need to think about how changes in the current exchange rate affect expected rates of return. And so let's write something out here and then we'll think about why that is, ends up being true. Depreciation of a country's currency today. Depreciation of a country's currency today. lowers the expected return on foreign currency deposits. Lowers the expected return on foreign currency deposits. So we need to think about why that happens. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's a little bit counterintuitive. But, but let's take a look at what's going on there. What we're going to be doing in the background is we're going to be holding interest rates constant and we're going to hold expectations about the future exchange rate constant for right now. And let's just think about what happens if this thing changes. So let's do a, a real simple example just to demonstrate what's going on. Let's suppose the exchange rate of dollars for euros is equal to 1.00. That, we actually have a name for that. When it, when it costs one dollar to buy one euro, we say that the dollar and euro are on par with each other. If it's close to one, it doesn't have to be exactly one, but if two currencies are on par, then one unit of, the, of one currency will exchange for approximately one unit of the other currency. So let's start there because it's nice and simple. Let's suppose that the euro interest rate is equal to 5%, 0.05, and let's suppose that the expected exchange rate, dollars for euros, is equal to 1.05. Therefore, we can figure out what the dollar return is on a euro deposit. So the dollar return on a euro deposit is going to be the euro exchange or the euro interest rate which is 0 0.05 plus the expected depreciation which is 1.05 minus 1 divided by 1 that gives us 0 0.05 plus 0 0.05 which is 0.1 10 percent so if we have an exchange rate of 1 the expected dollar return is going to be 10%. Now let's suppose that we have some depreciation of the dollar. Suppose the dollar depreciates. So now the exchange rate, the current exchange rate of dollars per euros, let's suppose it's 1.03. So now let's do this calculation again. The dollar rate of return is going to be 0 0.05 plus the expected rate of re return, 1.05 minus 1.03 divided by 1.03. That gives us 0 0.05 plus 0 0.019. So the dollar rate of return now is going to be 0 0.069. So the dollar return on euro deposits has fallen. So depreciation of a country's currency today lowers the expected return on foreign currency deposits. And, and what's going on here is that if you have depreciation of a currency today, 
that means that there's not going to be much as much depreciation over that year. <clears throat> and so this term falls, which lowers the dollar rate of return on that euro deposit. <clears throat> if we look at the relationship between these, we get some nice downward sloping relationship. What we're looking at is the relationship between the exchange rate, the dollar to euro exchange rate now, and the dollar, what I've got on this axis is going to be this term right in here. This is the dollar return on euro deposits, which is the euro rate of return plus the expected depreciation. I'm just going to write this this way. You know that that's the dollar to euro exchange rate. All of those would have that symbol right down there. Okay. So what we're seeing is that the higher the exchange rate now, the lower the dollar value of a euro deposit is. We have this downward sloping relationship. And you can think of these changes in the current exchange rate as being very short term, very temporary. Um, and the reason we want to think about that is that these changes that we're thinking about right here aren't going to be having any impact on the expectation of the exchange rate in the future. These are small short run changes that don't change our future expectations. So now what we want to do is think about equilibrium in this market. And what we're going to do now is represent the dollar rate of return on a dollar deposit, which would be somewhere along here. That dollar rate of return on a dollar deposit is just some rate of return. We know what we can earn on dollar deposits because there's no depreciation or appreciation that's going to be happening if we hold our, our wealth as dollar deposits. We don't have to make any exchange for another currency. So that's just a vertical line there. That doesn't have anything to do with the exchange rate. And as you can imagine, th this looks very similar to just kind of a basic demand and supply model and, and it works the same way. The equilibrium exchange rate is going to be found right there. There's our equilibrium exchange rate. I'm going to call it E star. So let's clear this off and then we'll take a closer look at how this model works. We'll think about what happens if the dollar rate of return changes, what happens if expectations change, and this is going to give us a nice simple way of understanding what causes the current exchange rate to go up or down. So let's clear this off and then we'll take another look at it. Okay, so I've got the picture that we just developed right over here. Let's just kind of review because I've got a little bit less information, maybe a little bit easier to understand version of what we came up with over here. So this downward sloping line here represents the expected return on euro deposits. I'm not going to write out that function because that looks more complicated than it needs to be. The vertical line here represents the return on dollar deposits, which of course does not have anything to do with the exchange rate because we never need to exchange one currency for another. This one's downward sloping because it does indeed depend upon the, the exchange rate. There, an exchange does need to be made to hold our wealth in euro deposits. Because of interest parity, <clears throat> we know that the market will only be in equilibrium when the return for both of those assets is equal to each other. So our equilibrium is going to be found right here. Let's just talk for a second about why we wouldn't have, why is it that we know that the exchange rate would not stop right here. Let's just say that exchange rate, we'll call it E1. Why do, how do we know that the exchange rate wouldn't just settle right there and then stop moving. And the reason that we know that is that at that exchange rate, the return on euro deposits is lower than the return on dollar deposits. What that means is 
people would be getting rid of euros and trying to buy dollars. There's going to be excess supply of euros and excess demand for dollars as savers try to convert their currency to hold it in dollar deposits rather than in euro deposits. And what that means is the dollar is going to appreciate. Well, the dollar appreciates when the exchange rate falls, right? This is the price of a euro in terms of dollars. And if the dollar is appreciating, that means you don't need as many dollars to buy a euro. And so if the exchange rate was up here, the fact that people would be exchanging euros for dollars or vice versa will cause that exchange rate to move down to right here. They're going to want dollars by getting rid of their euros. Okay. So now that we understand why our exchange rate is going to be found at that intersection, we can use this model to do a couple of different things to figure out what's going to cause the exchange rate to change. So let's talk about the effect of a change in a country's interest rates. So let's think about the effect of a change in interest rates. Interest rates. It's not unusual. If you pay attention to uh, the news, it, it's not unusual. You, you kind of have to be looking for it to uh, pick up on it, but you'll hear people talking about um, the exchange rates responding to a change in a country's interest rates. And that's easy to understand if you kind of have a background with how this model works. If you don't, then you might just say, well, I'm not sure why that happens, but um, maybe they know what they're talking about. It's easy to understand if you look at what goes on in this model. So let's kind of reproduce what we've got right over here. So our vertical axis, we've got the exchange rate. We've got this downward sloping schedule. Here's the dollar rate of return. This downward sloping schedule shows us the expected return on euro deposits. We've got this vertical schedule, this vertical line that shows us the rate of return, the dollar return on dollar deposits. So this is the dollar return on dollar deposits. Let's think about what happens. So let's identify our initial exchange rate. Let's call it E1. It's the dollar to euro exchange rate. Let's think about what happens if the dollar interest rate changes. So we'll start here at point A. Okay, start at A. Our exchange rate is E1. Let's identify our initial dollar interest rate. We'll call it R1. This is a dollar interest rate R1. Let's suppose that that dollar interest rate increases. Suppose the dollar interest rate increases to R2. That means this vertical line is going to shift to the right as the dollar rate of return increases. Clearly, we're going to move to a new equilibrium here at point B. And what we see is that that's going to cause the exchange rate to decline. In other words, the dollar is going to appreciate. And that should make sense because if this schedule moves to the right, then that means at this original exchange rate, the dollar rate of return would be higher than the expected rate of return you can earn on euros. People would be trying to get rid of their euros, convert them into dollars. There's excess demand for the dollar, excess supply of the euro. That causes the dollar to appreciate, which means that the dollar price of a euro falls. And so we reach a new equilibrium right down there at a new exchange rate that brings the rate of return, the dollar rate of return, into equilibrium with the expected euro rate of return. So an increase in the interest rate at home will cause the exchange rate to fall and it will cause 
um, the home currency to appreciate. Let's think about what would happen if expected exchange rates change. So we're talking about the interest rate in a country. Let's talk about um, expected exchange rate. Expected exchange rate. What we've been calling E with a little E up there. Let's do the same thing. Let's start here. We've got our exchange rate. We've got the dollar rate of return down here. We've got this schedule that shows the expected return on euro deposits. We've got this vertical schedule that shows the interest rate in dollars, the rate of return on dollar deposits. If we think about what causes or what will happen if the expected exchange rate changes, remember that this schedule, that thing, looks like that. this. This is the euro rate of return plus the expected exchange rate minus the current exchange rate divided by the current exchange rate. This is the expected depreciation. If we expect the exchange rate to rise, the expected exchange rate shows up here in the numerator of this thing. So an increase in this will drive all of this up. An increase, let's suppose we expect the exchange rate to rise, to increase then this schedule, let's identify our initial equilibrium here at point A, our initial exchange rate right here we'll call E1. If we expect the exchange rate to rise in the future, this whole schedule shifts to the right. We reach a new equilibrium right here up at point B. That results in a depreciation of the home currency, we'll call that E2. The exchange rate, the current exchange rate will rise if we expect it to be higher in the future. Not surprising. So an expectation of a higher exchange rate, expectations of a depreciation of the dollar, will cause the dollar to depreciate now. If we expect that to decrease, of course this would shift in the opposite direction. It would, it would result in a appreciation of the dollar, a decrease in the current exchange rate. So now you can see that what happens if home's interest rate rises. I should say before we end this that if the euro interest rate were to rise, it would have the same impact as what's happening here. An increase in the expected exchange rate shifts this to the right an increase in the euro interest rate would also shift this to the right. So an increase in the euro interest rate, the euro rate of return, would cause a depreciation of the dollar. Again, not surprising because rates of return are going up over there. People are going to want to get rid of dollars and buy euros to be holding their wealth in euro deposits. That is going to uh, create excess supply of the dollar, excess demand for the euro, and the dollar is going to depreciate. In other words, the exchange rate, the dollar price of the euro is going to be going up. So you can see there's a lot that goes into understanding why these schedules look the way they do, but once you put it all together and you just look at this model, it's actually pretty easy to understand. The current exchange rate depends upon the dollar interest rate, the euro interest rate. It depends on the expected exchange rate. So in any problem that you would see in a homework or maybe a test, I would just ask you, what's going to happen to the exchange rate if we had a change in any of these three things? And it's pretty easy to work through. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what causes the exchange rate to go up or down. I've said it several times just in this video, but it, it all boils down to demand and supply. 
like most things in economics do. So um, you could spend a whole semester's class understanding more about exchange rates, but again, hopefully that gives you a, a kind of a good idea of what causes the exchange rates to change. I'll see you in the next video.